talking about being spiritual. The first week we talked about this, we talked about being spiritual or how we become spiritual beings or spiritually attuned uh, to who we are. We talked about exercises that we must engage in. We talked about uh, practices that we must uh, do. We talked about relationships that we must have. And then last week we talked about the idea, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the idea that we have a spiritual anatomy, that we are made up of various parts. And sometimes the Bible refers to it as the, the, the heart or, or the mind or, or the will uh, or our desires. And that God meets us on all of these different levels. And that we must, if we are going to be spiritual people, we must allow Christ, we must allow God to be in every single one of those aspects of our lives. That's why the Bible says, <clears throat> the greatest command is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, with all thy soul, and with all of thy strength. And yet you and I know very well that though we try at times, that's not always what happens. You know, we set this goal that we want to be more spiritual people and that we want to engage in these spiritual practices and, and we know that we fall down. We know that there's trouble in our lives with keeping this connectedness with God who is a spirit. I mean, let's face it, if, if if it were not for God, if it were not for His Son being sent into this world, the possibility of you and I, the need for even, you and I to be, quote, spiritual beings or attuned to spiritual things would be non-existent. And yet, there's plenty that would be non-existent, perhaps including self, if we begin to consider those things. We have trouble. We have difficulty. And today I want to talk just a little bit about that difficulty as we talk about spiritual reformation, or if you want to call it spiritual restoration. For some of us, the idea of being spiritual has yet to begin. And we've talked about that in past weeks, but let, let me begin kind of with that point because we can never stress it enough. If you need, if it is your desire, to have God in your life and to create in you that clean heart that, that David so vehemently sought. That cleansing that so many have sought after. Then let today be the day. Let today be the day that you know you come to understand his word. You, you hear his call and you see his salvation. And you listen to those words and what he tells you about doing, about the sin that is in your life. Repent of it or change your mind about it. Based upon the faith that his word has created in you, the strength of conviction. And then allow that re repentance to, to lead you into the waters of baptism where God is going to wipe those sins clean. For the purpose of allowing you to rise to walk in newness of life. As Paul would say in the book of Romans in chapter 6. That's where the relationship begins. That is the beginning of the, the journey. That, that is the sign at the head of the trail that begins your walk as a child of God. What we're talking about today is what comes after that. And how it is that we stay connected with God. And how important it is that we stay connected with Him. See, because God's people have not always been real good at this task, have they? Let's read just a little bit of Matthew 12. Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days <clears throat> excuse me, and three nights um, in the heart of the earth. And the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, someone greater than Jonah is here. And the queen of the south will rise up in judgment of this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The Pharisees, the, the, the scribes, these, 
these religious leaders in the day in which Christ lived were constantly, constantly coming at Christ, trying to trap him in his words, trying to, to get him to, to trip up. Trying to set those traps. It was their constant endeavor. And you have to ask the question, you know, why? I mean, aren't these supposed to be God's people? I mean, aren't these supposed to be the, the, the people that he brought out of the land of Egypt? That he saved from the Assyrians and their captivity? That, that he brought out of, of the Babylonian captivity? And that's just three major events. Go back and look at all of the battles that he saved them in. Go back and look at all of the provisions that he made for them in places like the wilderness when they wandered around for 40 years. Go back and look at all of the great and wonderful things that he does. And really all you have to do is go back and read a few of the Psalms. A few of those Psalms that recount the history of God's people. And yet at the same time we see them constantly wanting to strain against the connection that they have with God. I, I remember a few years ago, I, I guess it's been several years ago uh, now, I had this pair of shoes. You, you ever have one of those pair of shoes that the more you wore them, the better they felt? And, and you know, these shoes became kind of, you know, your, your, your staple item that you, you put on every day. You know, if people were going to see you kind of out in a casual circumstance, you were probably wearing these shoes. Now, maybe you're the kind of person that has a different pair of shoes for every different day of the week. I don't know. But I had this pair of shoes. And they were a wonderful pair of shoes. But they began to fall apart. They began to fall apart. And my solution was to get some string. And to start sewing the shoes back together. Carrie's solution was a little bit different. Carrie's solution was wait till Ed goes to work, go to the closet and throw the shoes away, and go buy a new pair. And I'm sure there's, I see some of the women shaking their head, yes, done that before, probably going to have to do it again. Sometimes, kind of like the, the strings that hold that shoe together, the things that hold our spirituality together are, are the things that we strain against, you know, the most. We grow comfortable in them past the point where they, they become useful for us. We, we don't see them as fresh. We don't see them as new. We, we, we don't see them for, for what they really are. When it comes to our own, like, self-evaluation, we don't see that we're off base. We don't see that... The connections have become loose. They've become strained. They've become stretched. And the Jews didn't see it. The Old Testament calls it hardness of heart. A lot of times it refers to it as idolatry. Now by the time we move into the New Testament, it doesn't really call it idolatry anymore. The Baals and the Asheroths have pretty much been put away at, at this point. But all that really means is they've become better at it. They've become more refined in, in their practice. Rather than going out and carving a tree and making it look like something that they think might be a god or a representation of some kind of god, they just very simply made people gods. You see, by the time we begin reading Romans chapter 1, Paul reveals to us that they worship the creature rather than the creator. They became better at what they did. And we see it in the attitude and the mindset of these Pharisees who when God's Son is sent to this world to save humanity, the vehicle which they were to bring the Savior into the world, they reject Him. They question Him. They probe Him. They demand these signs. Now, is there anything wrong with asking for proof? No. I don't think Thomas was wrong in asking to see the, the nail prints or the gash in the side. But there's a big difference between asking for proof and asking for proof ad nauseum because you just simply don't want to believe. Because you just simply don't want to be connected. And that's the position these people stood in. For years they had grown in the practice of putting on the facade of idolatry. 
and rejecting Christ. But then he goes on and he tells the story to kind of reflect where they were in their spiritual condition. He says, when an unclean spirit has gone out of a person, beginning in verse 41 of chapter 12, Matthew. When an unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds its house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and they dwell there, and the last state of the person is worse than the first. So also it will be with this evil generation. There are several things that we can learn from this context. Number one, the only kind of spiritual cleansing is full spiritual cleansing. That's it. You can't halfway do the job and expect to get better. Here it says the condition is even worse. You can change the, the picture or what it looks like on the outside. Well, they changed the whole picture of their idolatry, but they never bothered to change the inward part, the heart part, that caused them to reject the Christ when He came. And unfortunately, because of it, they met their spiritual demise. I don't know if we remember it or not. Go back and kind of dig into your history a little bit. About 40 years after Christ came into this world and was not received by his own, according to John in the first chapter of his gospel, Jerusalem and the Jewish state, as a nation, as a practicing religious body, is wiped from the face of the earth because of the rejection of his son. Because of their failure, not for 40 years. That's just the period of repentance. For hundreds of years, rejected him. Did not desire, did not seek to maintain the connection with him. Now, I say all of that to get to this point. We look back on them and their example and their questioning and their complaints and all of the stuff they did. And yeah, we can just sit and kind of stay on the surface and be hypercritical of them and say, shame on you. Or we can ask the better question. What lesson may I learn and how is it then, if they failed in it, that I can maintain spiritual connectedness with God? How is it, if I'm not connected now and once was, that I can have spiritual restoration? And the answer, my friends, is found in a number of places in the Bible. But for the sake of time, we're just going to go to one of them. Turn with me over to the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 1. <clears throat> chapter 1. And we're just going to read the first uh, seven verses. The first seven verses. And I want you to notice just a couple of things. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have heard, looked upon, and which we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest. And we have seen it and testified to it and proclaim it to you, the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father. There's connectedness. And with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. That God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Three very simple points that I want to give you. Point number one. 
If we're going to be connected with God, we've got to know God. How do you know God? Well, that question can be answered in a number of ways. We can talk about the mechanisms by which we can know God. Or we can talk about the manner in which we know God. Well, the mechanisms are relatively simple, and we've kind of talked about that already. Prayer, Bible study, meditation, stillness, quietness, fasting. All of those things are kind of the mechanisms by which we can come to know God. But the thing that I want to emphasize to you here is the idea that it must be an intimate connection. If God's name is something that you simply say on Sunday mornings and afternoons, and maybe occasionally on Wednesday, if Jesus' name and his acts and his example are things that only pass through your mind on designated days of the week, then I would dare say that intimacy is probably going to be an issue. You know, on our Friday night evening devotional, Brother Keith Sabeel gave an excellent lesson. He he talked about using things in the world. For him, it's signs, and he actually had different signs, and he attached each one of those signs of Scripture or some thought. And you know what? Since that lesson, I've driven around, and every time I come up to one of those signs, I, I think about that lesson because he planted that seed in my head. So now driving is kind of a new experience for me. And when I see those signs, it's, it's a wonderful thing. If your spirituality is limited to a place and a time on a, on a certain day, then I would dare say we're kind of missing the boat. It's certainly, the relationship that we have is certainly an intimate one. I want you to notice what he says here. What he says here. He says, number one, we, we, we have heard that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. Now, I, I've probably explained this in, in the past, but there are several words in, in, in the book of John that are in this case. John loves to use the, this case, or excuse me, this tense, the, the perfect tense. And the perfect tense in the original language, the Koine Greek in which he wrote, has this quality of indicating not just something that he does, or not just something that he did, or not something that he's doing in the present. It is something that has been done and continues to be done to the point where it has reached a state of being. So John doesn't say, well, you know, we heard that before. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, you know, we have heard this and we stand today speaking to you, existing in the state of being, of having heard these things. In other words, his understanding of Christ, which is who he's talking about here. He refers to him as the everlasting life or the life eternal. Made a lasting impression on him. You ever have those moments in life you know, where something happens and, and there's that lasting impression? You know, a thousand things may happen to you that day, but you remember that one? Maybe it's the time you messed up or maybe it's the time you had a great victory or whatever it is. John's saying, that's the impression. It's, it's so affected me that it has reached a state of being. He does the same thing later on. He says, our eyes have seen. Different word, same tense. We see and stand in the state of seeing, discerned with our eyes. The same thing. A little bit different here, though. You've got to wonder, what's the difference between seeing and discerning with the eyes? Well, discerning with the eyes here in the original language is a longer, more intimate look at something. Uh, anybody ever been to Sawgrass Park over here on 62nd? You go over there and they have this little bridge that you can walk over, right? Well, right now, the, the water that's underneath of it is just covered with these, uh, well, I don't know, lily pads and then there's this odd looking green stuff. I don't know what it is. It's kind of cool. But Carrie knows what it is. She can tell you. But uh, it's covered with it. And you know, you cross over the bridge and you, huh, no alligators this time. And you keep on walking. We went around the trail. We came back. And then we stopped on the bridge. And we stood there for a while. And we looked. And we looked. 
and we looked. By the time we were done, just 15 minutes after, we counted eight alligators that we hadn't seen the first time through. See, that's the difference between seeing and discerning with the eyes. It's a more prolonged look, but here he's describing the relationship, the testimony that they have concerning Christ. And then the next thing he says, we made manifest these things to you. You weren't there, but you can know everything that was there because see, here it is. Here it is. Kind of like a ship's manifest. You want to know what's on the boat? Look at the manifest. You want to know what passengers are in what seat on that airplane? Look at the manifest. And then finally he says that we have formally announced it to you. To what end? Look at what he says again. To what end? That you may have fellowship with us. Well, why? Why? Because we have fellowship with the Father. In other words, we're connected to the Father by these things. By this, this intimacy, by seeing and by hearing, by experiencing. And we want you to be as well. You can have this connectedness. We must intimately know Him. Number two, we must know darkness. Darkness. Now, I'm using the word no in a little different sense than John's using it. What I mean by knowing darkness is by knowing that it is a possibility for your life. You see, if it weren't possible for you to have darkness in you, then the Bible would never mention it. The Bible would never mention it. Make no mistake about it, however. When the Bible does talk about darkness, it's referring to either ignorance of spiritual things, ignorance of things that are right and true and good, or it's speaking of things that are wantonly sinful or lawless or iniquity, transgressions, whatever word you want to use. But the Bible all throughout its pages talks about you can walk in darkness. You can have your body literally full of darkness, according to Christ in Luke chapter 11 and verse 53, excuse me, 34. We can commit to acts of darkness. We can walk in works of darkness. We can commune with darkness. There is a ruler of the darkness. And there is a power that darkness can have over our lives. Hold your place there in John. And just go over very quickly to the book of Ephesians. To Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> We're going to do just a couple of verses uh, and kind of walk through Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians is all about the is the book all about the walk of Christianity. So it really no wonder that he mentions darkness here, because just as easy as you can walk in the light as he is in the light, you can walk in the darkness as he is not in the darkness. One in verse thirteen, <clears throat> Paul's writing and he says this. In him you also, when you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit uh, of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire uh, possession of it, to the praise, uh, excuse me, to <clears throat> the praise uh, of his uh, glory. In other words, you know, we've reached this state of spiritual connectedness. You can be spiritual. <clears throat> <clears throat> It'll pass in a second. <clears throat> you can be spiritually connected with God. You can have that inheritance. You have this spirit as uh, the guarantee. But then notice some of the other things that he's going to write here. For instance, go over with me to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5. Right around verses 7 uh, and 8. 7 and 8. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret." 
But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. To, to kind of put it in a little nutshell here, if you're in darkness, you're not alive spiritually. The only way to be alive spiritually is to be in the light. Now, if you are in darkness, heed the words. Awake, O sleeper. Go over just one more chapter. Chapter 6. <clears throat> chapter 6. I want us to notice uh, verse 12. For the sake of time, we'll just read that one verse. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. <clears throat> when I say we must know darkness, what I'm saying is we must know it's possible. We must know it's there. And we must stay focused on those things that are right and true and good. But then lastly, we must come out of darkness and into light. What does that mean? Well, on one level, it means denying things that we really, really like. Over 20 billion served, right? Where's that? McDonald's, right? You ever go to McDonald's and, and, <clears throat> and get the Happy Meal? And then wonder afterwards, you know, what's so happy about it? I mean, I'm not happy. Usually the kids aren't happy. You know, because that toy that they're advertising on TV, yeah, try to find that at your local McDonald's. You get some cheap fatty hamburger in a cheap cardboard box with a cheap toy that nobody wants. Now, if you work at McDonald's, I don't mean to offend. But there's really not much that's happy about it. Of course, you know, the big clown, man, he's got a big smile. Wonder why. 20 billion people served. Three bucks a piece. You do the math. Oh, Ronald's real happy. You may not be happy. Sin may make you happy for a time. But it has about as much substance as that little cardboard box with the cheap rinky-dink toy and the fatty burger with very little nutritional value. Unfortunately, it's the thing that most people settle for. They're not like Moses who denied the pleasures for a season to do those things that were right and good. In order to come out of darkness and into the light, we're going to have to put away things that, at least for the present, have made us happy. Maybe the things that in present have earned us lots of money. And maybe things in the present have actually won us many a friend. There's a psalm that I love to read from time to time back in the book of Psalms. It's about a guy who really questions this idea of the difference between right, righteousness and, and unrighteousness. And his thoughts are kind of like this. He says, you know, God, help me understand. Why is it that the wicked always seem to prosper? Why is it that the guy over here dwelling in darkness always seems to, to make the money and to win the friends and to have the big house and, and all of that? And I'm trying to do the right thing and I never get ahead. And he says, you know, this is really causing my feet to slip spiritually. And then the psalmist reveals that the answer was found as he went to the house of God and contemplated the end of the unrighteous person. You see, you're not going to get to the light of eternity by living in darkness here. 
The light of eternity is only accessed by living and walking in the light here. Second of all, it means that we're going to have to get rid of falsehood. Which means we're actually going to have to admit that, that, that things are wrong in our lives from time to time. Go back to, to 1 John again. And I want you to notice, just read one uh, verse for, further. <clears throat> First John chapter 1, uh, notice uh, verse uh, 8. Uh, if I can go. <clears throat> First John chapter 1, verse 8. He says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we <clears throat> confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have to confess faults. We have to say that we're wrong. And then finally, coming out of darkness and into light, means that I change the manner of my walk in this world. It shouldn't be just a momentary thing. As a matter of fact, if you go back to the original language and you read the passage, it, it sounds more like this. But if we continually walk in the light, as He is continually in the light, we have continual fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses us from all sins. That's the way it sounds. But is that the sense in which you're living it? I hope it is. But this morning, if you're here and you're in need of that spiritual restoration, maybe the path that, that, that you've walked is, is one that is just leading you to more darkness. Expose it today. Put it into the, to the open light. Expose it to God and let Him take care of those things for you. If you're here this morning and subject to the invitations call in any way, we urge you to make it known as together we stand and sing.